the Lord. And we're honored and privileged, of course, to have Dr. Fruchtenbaum with us again this morning. Uh, we're teaching at this uh, hour the rise and fall of the Antichrist, something that should be timely as we see the way the world is developing around us. Just some very quick needs to know. We take the break between the services, and that's the best time to visit the resource table back there and take full advantage of that as you grab your cup of coffee and whatever. Don't, don't spill it on the books, but, uh, but look those over, and there's some wonderful resources back there. I remind you at the close of the worship service today, there will be a, uh, a plate being passed, and it's exclusively for a love offering for Dr. Fruchtenbaum, our appreciation for him uh, ministering to us, and for Aerial Ministries, which of course is a very worthy cause. At the close of this session today on the rise and fall of the Antichrist, uh, the, the doctor will answer a few questions. So if you have something you'd like to ask him, kind of save that up. Uh, let me pray and briefly introduce him, and we're going to turn it over to Dr. Fruchtenbaum. Father, we thank you that we have your word, and thy word is truth. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is the word. We thank you, Father, that you bring light and hope and joy because you have the future in your hands. And regardless of the things that go on in this fallen world, we can look through that to, to you and give thanks that you're the sovereign in control of all things. We ask you to speak through Dr. Fruchtenbaum this morning and open our hearts and minds to your truth and guide us, Father, in all that we do here. Help us to please you with our thinking with, uh, from the bottom of our heart and with thanksgiving and joy. We praise you for who you are in Christ's name. Amen. After coming in contact with the gospel at age 13, Dr. Fruchtenbaum came to faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and he was ostracized by members of his own family and friends. Uh, later, we'll advertise as such uh, the fact that he has a biography back there about his life, not an easy life, difficult many in many ways, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good read. He later graduated from Cedarville, uh, Roger, you can appreciate that, for example. From Dallas Theological Seminary and finally from New York University, he studied and taught extensively in Israel and know that uh, God moved in all of these circumstances to prepare him for the ministry at Ariel that he is doing today and blessing people like us all around the world. And uh, because of his very basic, thorough understanding an exegetical study of God's Word. So we're so privileged uh, to have you, Doctor, and uh, please come and, and teach us. Okay, if you look at your outline on the rise and fall of the Antichrist, there are certain elements we've already covered in uh, the sequence of the previous two nights on the sequence of events. So I'm not going to repeat all that. We're only going to move into the newer material. <coughs> so cover Roman numeral 1, Roman numeral 2, Roman numeral 3. We'll pick up Roman numeral 4, the rise of the Antichrist. And let's turn to Daniel chapter 8. And we shall see what is taught in verses 23 to 25. I won't read the passage to make sure we can fit everything in. But the main points he makes in these verses is, first of all, in verse 23, he'll be involved in occultic practices. 
In verse 20, first part of verse 24, he points out that he will have power, but it doesn't come from him. It comes from a, another source, and that is the one who turned out to be his father, which is Satan. And by means of the power his, um, that Satan has given him, in the second part of verse 24, he will be able to destroy many of the mighty ones around the world. But in the last element of verse 24, he is specifically will attack the saints, the believers of that day. And in verse 25, he'll be characterized by craftiness and deceitfulness. And those who support him will be elevated. Those who not support him will be persecuted even to death. A bit more extensive, let's look at Daniel chapter 11. In verses 36 to 39. Verses 36 to 39. Here we we'll learn four specific things. First of all, in the first part of verse 36, he'll be characterized by willfulness. He does what he wants in accordance with his own will. Also, in the second part of verse 36, he'll be characterized by self exaltation, in the sense that he will feel that he's the most important human being. And furthermore, it'll reach a level in verse 37 of self-deification, in that he will not worship the pagan gods that his ancestors worshipped, but he'll worship someone else, which turned out, as we know from Genesis 3.15 from last night, that uh, Satan, who is the one that um, energizes him to come into being. So in verse 38 and 39, he'll be controlled by Satan, his father. So what he does in his own willfulness and all decisions is all in the, initiated and inaugurated by his own orig originator, and that is Satan. Let's look at a third passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thess chapter 2. Look at verse 8. Then shall be revealed the lawless one, whom the Lord Yeshua shall slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the manifestation of his coming, even he whose coming is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. In verse 8, notice, he'll be characterized by lawlessness. And furthermore, in verse 9, he'll be energized by Satan. And the same kind of terms used for the ones God raised up as prophets or apostles, the same terms are now used of the power that the Antichrist will have, but the source of this power is not coming from God, but coming from Satan. As we noted yesterday, he rises to power before the tribulation begins. He continues to become more and more powerful in the first half of the tribulation, then things will begin to change. As we noted in Daniel chapter 7, verses 23 and 24, Daniel 7, 23 and 24, he will declare war against the ten kings that were co-reigning with him. In this war, he will kill three of them, and at that point, the other seven will submit to his authority. And the same point is made in Revelation 17, Verses 12, 13, and 17, chapter 17, verses 12, 13, and 17. Again, after killing the other three of the kings, all the other seven still living are going to submit this authority, so he'll become the counterfeit king of kings, the Lord of Lords. It is only at the midpoint of the tribulation that he'll take full political control of the whole world. In 
And once he gains full political control, because those other seven kings are no longer independent monarchs, they all work under his authority, he'll then begin to take world of religious control. So looking at Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17, And Revelation 17 focuses on, on religious Babylon, while chapter 18 turns over to the city of Babylon, and the religion of Babylon will be based in the city of Babylon. And what he describes throughout this chapter is a woman. When the woman is used symbolically, it always symbolizes a religious entity, which could be the positive or negative. On the positive side, Israel is the wife of Jehovah, and the church is the bride of the Messiah. On the negative side, early in Revelation 2, was the uh, woman known as Jezebel. And here in chapter 17, the great harlot. So here you have two negative usages. So what chapter 17 focuses primarily is, the, is a one world religion. There's some the unification of all false denominations, all false religions into one world super church, counterfeit church, and this would be the counterfeit bride of the Messiah. And this religious system will, will rule the religious affairs of the world with the source of, with the support of the human governments for the first half of the tribulation. Once the Antichrist gains worldwide political authority, he will make a change to also gain worldwide religious authority. So looking at chapter 17, verse 16, chapter 17, verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw, and the beast ye shall hate the harlot, and shall make her desolate, and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and shall burn her utterly with fire. So once the Antichrist has all of this political authority around the world, with this political authority, he will now destroy this one world religion, because he doesn't want to have any kind of competition with him. And he'll, as we, as we shall soon see, he'll declare himself to be God Almighty. So in gaining religious control, first of all, he destroys this one world religion. Secondly, in chapter 11, verse 7, chapter 11, verse 7, he will kill the two witnesses. The two witnesses will be two Jewish men God will raise upon to be his ministers for the first half of the tribulation. And they're given a, a time ministry of 1,260 days in verse 3. That was three and a half years, and so they function during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Anyone trying to kill them during that period of time end up being killed themselves. But once the 1,200 three score days are up, and we're now at the midpoint, Satan, uh, Antichrist, will be able to do what the others had failed to do. And we read in chapter 11, verse 7, 11, verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, which lasted for three and a half years, when they shall finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss shall make war with them and overcome them and kill them. <coughs> so after destroying one point of opposition, a false religious system, the great harlot, he now also begins to kill those who represent the true spiritual forces, that includes these two witnesses, and they'll be killed at the midpoint of the tribulation. And the whole world will be so happy that the dead, their bodies lie on the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. After three and a half days of lying on the streets of the city, God will raise them back to life and they'll be able to watch these two witnesses, not only to be resurrected, but also the ascent to go into heaven. A third thing he will do is something we saw yesterday in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Daniel 7, verse 25. 
is to begin warring against the saints, focusing specifically on the Jewish people in general, but on the saints among the Jews in particular, the Messianic Jews of that particular point of time. The second half of the tribulation, he will be the one world political ruler, but also the one world religious ruler. Now, next on your outline, the death and resurrection of the Antichrist. The passage in Daniel 11, verses 40 through 45, let's go ahead and turn to it, describes a world war that will occur at the midpoint of the tribulation. That will be the war of the Antichrist against the ten kings, during which time he will kill three of those kings. And then 11 verses 40 through 45, he describes this war. But notice the specific point, verse 41, he shall also enter into the glorious land in the context of Daniel, that would be the land of Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown. But these, and notice there are going to be three nations that will escape his political domination, the ancient lands of Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Now today, all three of these ancient countries make up one nation today, and that is the Hashemite Kingdom of the Jordan. So modern-day Jordan includes these three ancient territories, but also Gilead, the local Gilead at the northern end of uh, Jordan. The principle here is that throughout Jewish history, where one part of the world began persecuting the Jews, God would always open the door for the Jews to escape elsewhere. And one of the crucial dates in Jewish history is the year 1492. That is when the emperor and empress of Spain issued the Edict of Expulsion, and all Jews had to leave Spain unless they convert to Catholicism. That was also the same year that Columbus be began to sail and trying to find a passage to India, he ended up following, for discovering the um, North and South American coastlines. And that became the a haven for Jewish refugees fleeing persecution in different countries of Europe. First of all, Spain, then Portugal, then other countries. Now, in the tribulation, when the whole world turns against the Jewish people, notice God will still see that three countries remain independent of the Antichrist's authority. And this is the territory that the Jews will flee to when they see the abomination of desolation. Primarily they'll flee to the land of Edom, and Edom today is southern Jordan. There'll be Jews also fleeing some to Egypt and some to Assyria, which is today is northern Iraq. But the primary forces of Jews fleeing and leadership will flee to the city of Bozra, B-O-Z-R-A-H, B-O-Z-R-A-H. And that is where the Jews will be in hiding for the second half of the tribulation. Not all Jews will flee there, but the bulk of the leader of the people but also the leadership will be fleeing there. This is Micah chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, Micah 2, 12 and 13. Now with this background, let's turn to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And we'll survey verses 1 through 8. Verses 1 and 2 describe satanic authority through the Antichrist over the kingdoms of the world. And together in chapter 12 and chapter 13, we see the development of the counterfeit trinity. Satan is the counterfeit father, the false prophet, the counterfeit Holy Spirit, but Antichrist will be the counterfeit uh, son. 
And the first part of verse 3, in this war he'll himself end up being killed. And I saw one of his heads as though it had been smitten unto death, and his death stroke was healed. It was sometimes how the verse 3 is actually interpreted is it says as though he had been slain. He's not really killed. He simply fakes a death and therefore fakes a resurrection. But it's always wise to see how phrases are used within the same book. So keep your finger here and turn momentarily to Revelation chapter 5. And verse 6, Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And I saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing, and notice, as though it had been slain. Now he's dealing with the messianic son. And it says, as though he had been slain. Does that mean he did not really die on the cross? All four Gospels testify he died a real death on the cross. And by normal human experience, he should have remained dead in, from then on. But all of a sudden, he was not very much alive again by virtue of the resurrection. And so the phrase, as though it had been slain, is a Greek idiom for a resurrected individual. And notice in chapter 5, verse 6, the same phraseology that is used of the true son, going back to chapter 13, is also used of the counterfeit son. He really does die. In chapter 12, where Satan is confined to the earth for the second half of the tribulation, he will use his abilities to resurrect his counterfeit son. So you have a counterfeit death and a counterfeit resurrection, not counterfeit in the sense he did not die. He really did die, as we see from comparing the phraseology with the Messiah's death. But it is as though he died only because he was resurrected from the dead. So we have here a counterfeit death and resurrection. At this point, the war against the ten kings will continue. He'll succeed in killing three of them, and then the other seven will submit his authority. And once he has both political power and religious power, he will then commit the event described under Roman numeral six, the abomination of desolation. Now certain key verses, we won't take time to look, at, look them up, but when I finish the whole study, but the first passage is Daniel 9, verse 27, which we did look at yesterday. In Daniel 9, 27, this, this event will occur right in the middle of the tribulation with the breaking of the seven-year covenant. It doesn't explain what the abomination is, but it tells us when it happens at the midpoint of the tribulation. The second passage is Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 12, Verse 11, but the abomination would be allowed to continue for 1,290 days. Now the second half of the tribulation is 1,260 days, and so the abomination would be allowed to continue an extra 30 days beyond the end of the tribulation. Here again, doesn't tell us what the abomination is, simply how long it'll be allowed to continue, exactly 1,290 days. The third passage is Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16. And in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, the abomination of desolation serves as a sign to Israel to flee the land. Here again, doesn't say what it is but it's a to the Jews in the land to flee the land. Fourth passage is Revelation 11, verse 1 and 2. Revelation 11, verse 1 and 2. It's, it's the abomination occurs in connection with the Gentile retaking of Jerusalem and more specifically the temple compound of that future day. Here again, doesn't say what the abomination is, only that's going to be in connection with the Gentile retaking of Jerusalem and the temple compound. 
So this was conquest in the Six-Day War. It's, it's going to be safe for now, but they're going to lose it again at the midpoint of the tribulation and have to flee the land. Now, what the abomination actually is, is, is actually two stages. The fifth passage is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, that he will sit in the temple and declare himself to be God Almighty and call upon the whole world to worship him as God. And that will be the first stage of the abomination of desolation, his own self-declaration of deity, and the call for all humanity to worship him as God. He will not stay in Jerusalem. He will set up his world political headquarters in the rebuilt city of Babylon. But then will come the second stage of the abomination, and that's here in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 15. Revelation 13, 11 through 15 where there will be an image, <coughs> an image of the Antichrist, and this image will be given life. It will have the power to even kill. And this image will be erected in the Holy of Holies of the Jewish temple, and that will be the second stage of the abomination of desolation. The word abomination normally carries some kind of an idolatrous form, and this is the idolatrous form. So what's happening in verses 11 through 15 is the introduction of the counterfeit Holy Spirit. And just as the Holy Spirit draws people to worship the true Son, the counterfeit Spirit will draw people to worship the counterfeit Son, and even to do the worship of an idol of the counterfeit Son. And he'll be given the power to do counterfeit signs and wonders for the purpose of worldwide deception. Which brings us to Roman numeral 7, the mark of the beast in verses 16 through 18. Let's read these, because often these have been taken out of context and applied in a way it should not be applied. Verse 16, and he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the bond, that there be given them a, the mark on the right hand or upon the forehead, that no man should be able to buy or to sell, save he that had the mark, even the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. He that had understanding, let him count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, often not, not, not realizing the timing, the timing of even being able to take the mark only begins at the midpoint of the tribulation. And people who came back from Israel about 20, 30 years ago, they noticed that the buses and other cars driving around Jerusalem had under license plate 666. All of a sudden, that was supposed to be the mark of the beast. Now, in the United States, we have 50 states, and each state has its own license plate. So Texas has their own, New York has its own, California has its own. But the state of Israel only is one state, so divided into regions. So the first three numbers on license plates simply focused on the region. They've changed that now, but the regions were 111, 222, 333. They actually had to come to 666 not to portray the sign of the Antichrist, but it simply falls between 555 and 777. And that was just the region from when those cars were registered. That's all, it had nothing to do with this biblical text. And people felt that this is also going to be um, the internal revenue service of our government or there's going to be a chip placed inside the skin, though the Greek word here is not under the skin, but the Greek word for upon the skin. There'll be a visible sign on the skin. Those who take the mark have a choice to put it on their hand or upon their forehead, but that is a visible mark like a tattoo. 
But the issue of the mark won't even be a reality until the midpoint of the tribulation. And it tells us we can determine what it signifies. And what these three verses at the end of chapter 13 clearly show is that it, it is the numerical value of the Antichrist name. We don't know what the name is. And it's all kinds of different combinations that can reach 666. For example, 5 and 1 is 6, 2 and 4 is 6, so is 4 and 2, 3 and 3 is 6, 5 and, and so on. There's no way to determine this name uh, in advance. But once we begin to see a, a prominent figure, and if we know how to put his name in using the Hebrew alphabet, not the Latin alphabet, we call it English alphabet, but it's really the Latin alphabet. And Spanish and French also use the same alphabet. Now in classic, in modern Hebrew, there's a distinction between letters and numbers, but not in classical Hebrew. Every letter was also a number. And the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. And the first 10 are in sequences of ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It then moves into sequences of tens to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and then finally 200, 300, and 400. So every Hebrew letter has numerical value. Every word using the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical value. So anybody that knows some basic Hebrew can look at the, a person's name using the Hebrew alphabet. Doesn't mean it's Jewish, just means all, all these names can be done in Hebrew characters. Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar were not Jews, but we can figure out the numerical value from the Hebrew lettering. And so the numerical value of the Antichrist name, whatever it might be, will equal 666. That's what it means. Nothing to do with social security checks. Nothing to do with things put underneath your skin. It'd be a very visible sign. So for those who will accept the Antichrist as their God are going to be the ones to take this mark. And so that'll be the actual mark to be taken but nobody will take it before the midpoint of the tribulation. And by then, the members of the body of the Messiah are already gone from this earth. Now, Roman numeral eight, the revelation of the Antichrist. If you look going back to Second Thess chapter two, there are two separate revelations are going to be of the Antichrist as to who he is. The first one is in the first three verses of chapter 2. Now I beseech you, brethren, touching the coming of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, and are gathering together unto him, the end that ye be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet be troubled either by, either by spirit or by word or by epistle as from us that the day of the Lord is just at hand. Let no man be God, any wise for it will not be. What will not be? The day of the Lord. It will not be, except the falling away come first, and the man of sin be revealed, and the son of perdition. So the first revelation of who the Antichrist will be is to saints living before the start of the tribulation. Whether this is pre-rapture or post-rapture is not, we don't know because the rapture can happen any time between today and the signing of the covenant. But the saints living at that point of time, whether they are pre-rapture saints or post-rapture saints, they're the ones that will be able to determine if the person the Antichrist by putting his name in the, using the Hebrew alphabet and it should equal 666. But that's a revelation given to saints of that day. Not the way the saints will know about this is because of the annunciation or announcement of the soon signing of the seven-year covenant. The second revelation is a bit different, and we'll skip down to verse 4. 
He that opposes and exalts himself against all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now ye know that which restrains, to the end that he may be revealed in his own season. For the mystery of lawlessness does already work. Only there is one that restrains now until he be taken out of the way, and then shall be revealed the lawless one, whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing in the manifestation of his coming. The event he describes now has to do with the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist will sit in the temple and setting himself forth as God. And when he does this, there'll be a revelation of his true character, but this time to the Jewish audience of that day. At the midpoint of the tribulation, the Jews of Jerusalem come to faith already as a result of the resurrection of the two witnesses. This is not all Israel yet, but at least the Jews of Jerusalem. And because they have become believers and they see the abomination, they will follow the instructions by Jesus in Matthew 24, verses 15 through 22. Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22. And they will begin to flee the land. So the first revelation will happen before the day of the Lord to the saints living at that point of time. But then at the midpoint, there'll be a second revelation specifically to the Jewish people, and they realize the nature of the one they made a covenant with. Let's let's now go to the last segment, the fall of the Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 to 16, Revelation 16, verses 12 to 16, describes the beginning of the first stage of the campaign of Armageddon. There are eight stages. That's the first stage. Later on in the sixth stage, you have the second coming. And in the passage we just read in 2 Thess chapter 2, verse 8, 2 Thess chapter 2, verse 8, he will, the Antichrist will be the first casualty of the second coming. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 4 through 11, Isaiah 14, verses 4 through 11, describes the soul of the Antichrist as he goes into hell. And all the kings, the spirits of the kings who entered hell before he did, will rise up in astonishment, surprised that he too ended up in the same place where they were at. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 16 to 21, Isaiah 14, 16 to 21, the body of the Antichrist lies exposed, unburied. His body is being trampled upon by the feet of his own fleeing soldiers. And then Isaiah points out his body will never see burial. His body will never see burial. And the reason for that is in Revelation 19, verses 19 to 21. Revelation 19, 19 to 21. Because he himself will be resurrected again, but not by Satan's power, by the power of the messianic son. And he will be thrown with the false prophet, the counterfeit spirit, into a lake of fire. They'll have the lake of fire all to themselves for the first thousand years of its habitation. We know from Matthew 25, last verse, is that the lake of fire was actually um, put together for the purpose of angels that fell. But now it'll be the first ones to actually go into the lake of fire is going to be the Antichrist and the false uh, prophet, the counterfeit son, the counterfeit spirit. And so the Antichrist tried to be, uh, to try to be as close to possible as, as to the authentic son. But now Messiah himself will let him, let him go one step further than he wanted to go. Because just as the resurrection of the Messiah was the first fruits of the first resurrection, and the first resurrection is resurrection to immortality, and the only one resurrected to immortality thus far, is the Messiah himself. See, Messiah is the first fruits of the first resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 to 20, 23. 
But now Revelation 19, verse 21, he'll be the first one to be resurrected into non-immortality. And that he will be resurrected from the dead, but he would not have a glorified body. But he'll be thrown into lake of fire, and he'll have the whole lake of fire to himself along with the false prophet for the first thousand years of its habitation. And that's what, that will inaugurate the Messianic Kingdom. And the prelude to the Messianic Kingdom and the prelude to the Tribulation will be the rapture of the Church, and that is going to be the topic we'll cover in the next hour. Okay, we have about five minutes for any questions that you might ask. Anybody have a question so far?